So um, thank you for coming to the Queens Historical Society's digital visit program on It's Electric, the History of Computers. Um, this program has been made possible by a grant from uh, Con Edison. Um, and with the It's Electric program, we want to share knowledge on uh, STEM topics and STEAM topics as well. And uh, in this case, we're going to be going over the history of computers. Um, I aim to focus mostly on things before the, the 70s. Uh, so we're going to be focusing on the first th two or three generations of computers that we'll, we'll touch on the, uh, the slightly newer stuff um, and even look at uh, what computers are looking like today. Um, if you guys have any questions, please type into chat. Uh, I have the chat window in front of me, uh, so that way I can see your messages. It might take me a while to, to notice them, so uh, just be, bear with me on that. Um, if you have any trouble hearing me or a slide isn't showing up, uh, please mention that in the chat. Uh, sometimes these kind of technical issues can pop up. Uh, but without further ado, um, I think we should begin. So as long as there has been business, uh, people have needed to keep track of numbers, uh, values and things that need to be tabulated and keep kept square. Things need to be uh, made sure that they're being kept track of. And so as long as there's numbers, there is math. So as mathematics has progressed further and further from just arithmetic to things such as calculus and geometry, the need for more and more complex equations has grown. So the trouble with math is that as it gets more and more complex, and even with the simple stuff, people make mistakes. Um, it's a fact of being human. So we have tried everything in our power to reduce these mistakes by using machines. Um, but it's still very important that we make the machines correctly. Um, but if mistakes happen in these calculations, terrible things can happen. Uh, there's actually uh, instances in space travel where uh, an engineer accidentally forgot to convert between centimeters and inches. And so the satellite thought it was going a lot slower than it was. And so it smashed into the surface of, uh, I believe it was an asteroid. Um, there is also uh, an instance of a, um, a computer bug causing a few zeros to be left off of a Japanese stock price causing something that was supposed to be sold for tens of dollars to be sold for pennies, mm -hmm. causing all of it to be sold rather quickly and causing the, the company to almost go bankrupt. So with machines to do these calculations, uh, it's a lot safer to, to do um, our mathematics. However, before we had electricity to do these mathematics very quickly, we actually had something else entirely to do our equations. We had people. There were professional people whose entire job was to be a computer. And that was the name of their job title, is computer. Because they would sit there and compute. So. Uh, these people would have to sit there and do long and arduous calculations, uh, usually to break up um, the work that the mathematician or the scientist would have to do. So they would offload that tedious work to someone else who is skilled at math to do it for them. So that way they could focus on more important things. Um, one of the first instances of this is actually in 1757 uh, when mathematician uh, Alexis Claude Clariot uh, wanted to take, uh, tackle the challenge of predicting when Halley's Comet would reappear. Uh, at this point, they had 
the gravitational model, uh, I believe, thanks to Tyke. And uh, so they were sought out to, to calculate when the, the comet would reappear. Um, but this would have taken very long and complex uh, calculations that would take a very long time. So Caloro did not want to sit there and do it himself. So he broke it up uh, amongst a team uh, that included another um, astronomer named uh, Jerome Joseph uh, Lalonde and uh, Nicole René Laporte, uh, who was a clockmaker's clock wife who enjoyed doing math. Um, so the two of them were able to calculate the time of Halley's Comet's uh, next arrival accurate to up to two days, which despite being wrong was still an achievement for the time considering it was all done by hand and we're talking about a, a calculation predicting something many years in advance. So these human computers would actually be most frequently used in fields like astronomy well into the 20th century. Um, computers were also hired extensively, and these are human computers, hired extensively during World War I and World War II to, um, to help during the WPA to assist engineers. These positions that were created uh, by these um, wars were often given to groups that were otherwise blocked from uh, a career in uh, the engineering, science, technology, and math, uh, because since the job was tedious, many of the educated white uh, engineers thought it, such tedious work was beneath them. So uh, frequently women, disabled people, and people of color would be hired as um, computers. But computers have not just been humans. Uh, we have been seeking to supplement the human element with the machine element for many, many years. A special mechanized computers have existed in many different forms uh, for a very long time, uh, including things like automata, uh, which could be programmed to do things like write messages. And I believe I have a picture. I do not have a picture. Um, the automata, uh, things like uh, lined up toys, dolls, um, if you've ever seen the movie Hugo, that's a movie about an automata, uh, automata, sorry, um, that could write messages and draw pictures. Um, they could move, they could sing, uh, stuff like a cuckoo clock is an automata, uh, automata. <laughs> and um, even things like music boxes are considered uh, automata. Um, as they're mechanized and pre-programmed to perform a function, making music. Um, they use pins and or holes to, to play music. Um, we've even had tools like the abacus uh, since ancient times, which could be used to help keep track of numbers and perform calculations rather quickly. Um, and that way people didn't have to remember things in their head and keep track of numbers because that's a good source of error. Um, but another very famous uh, computer whoop, is, why well, didn't it show up? All right, let me try that again. Share screen. The, this thing, this hunk of rusty metal is called the Antikythera machine. Uh, this was discovered in the 1900, early 1900s, um, but the actual machine itself uh, dates to around 80 BCE. Uh, this was found in, in a shipwreck um, and it's actually a device uh, engineered by the ancient Greek to calculate and keep track of um, the position of the sun, the moon, uh, the stars. Uh, it's basically a solar calendar. It, it would have a, a bunch of arms on it and a big spiral. Um, and as the arms moved around, it would point to specific events 
throughout the year, and you could use this to keep track of various different things, um, including uh, the Pan-Hellenistic Games, uh, which are similar to the Olympics. Um, so this is a, a great example of ancient uh, computers. However, um, we also have examples from the mid-1600s. So let me see if I've got the picture of that. I don't have a picture of that. Uh, the Blaise Pascal was a famous mathematician, and he created in the mid 1600s the Pascaline. This was a a, a device that was similar to a mechanical calculator. It could. Uh, it, it innovated on the idea of adding two numbers by allowing it to mechanically carry numbers over to the next digit. So if you add five plus five, the tens digit will increment to account for the addition. Um, this was a, a major inter innovation for mechanical calculators because now we could add larger numbers. Um, this kind of a machine, though, was more of a fancy thing. It wasn't more something to be used. Um, it remained uh, kind of a an object of art and uh, a d display of intelligence. Oh, I see chat messages. Oh, hold on. It's not showing up. Why is it not showing up? Here we go. Yes, thank you, uh, Costas, for posting that. So, um, yeah, these machines would be uh, redesigned over the, the course of the next few centuries uh, to add additional features. Um, and by 1727, uh, even division was possible on these early mechanical calculators. But like I said, these would be individually made machines uh, and kept in the royal court. Uh, so the everyday person would not be able to have them because a someone like a clockmaker would have to spend the time and individually make each part and make the mis machine bespoke, really. Um, so there was no uh, mass production available on this kind of a machine. Um, but... By the late 1800s, this is post-industrial revolution, uh, desktop versions of these uh, adding machines were being designed and manufactured. These machines would typically be designed uh, or meant for places of business uh, where you'd purchase one machine and it would sit in the middle of the office and someone who needed to do a bunch of calculations like the, um, uh, the bookkeeper could go over perform the calculations, and then it would be shared. Um, they would be pretty much like a piece of furniture. Um, but the, the sizes of these machines would vary depending on how many digits you need. Uh, some businesses aren't dealing with millions of dollars or dealing with such large calculations that they need to go that big. So they'd get cheaper machines with fewer digits. Or if they were dealing with the big bucks, bigger machines with more rows because each row required its own mechanism. So for every digit you wanted, you'd have to scale the machine up to accommodate. Um, but I think it would be impossible to talk about mechanical computers without talking about uh, Charles Babbage. So Babbage is known for being a very strange fellow. Um, even during his time, many people uh, considered him difficult to work with. Um, but he was an absolute genius when it came to designing these uh, machines. And he would uh, create vast designs and plans to, uh, to show off his machines. And, uh, oh, wait, no, I skipped a machine that I want to talk about. This is a, uh, another example of a machine um, from before the, uh, this is, uh, gosh, where is it? 
sorry, my, ah. This is the uh, a 1800s uh, device called a tide calculator by Sir William Thompson. Um, you can see that it uses a bunch of pulleys and a crank and these offset wheels uh, to drive this machine. Um, because of the cyclical nature of tides, you could use math and wheels to create different cycles with different offsets to, to calculate tides. Um, and so this machine was created to predict what tides would be at different times of day. Uh, similar, uh, there is another very fancy machine that I want to talk about, um, but I, I think there's someone else who would do a much better job of uh, actually talking about it. Um, this is the, the harmonic analyzer. Um, I actually have a, a link for this. Um, I would recommend watching this later. Um, I actually have a number of links to share, um, but I will post this into chat. Uh, this is a video by Bill Hammond about the harmonic analyzer. This is a machine that uses a similar principle of different sized gears. Oh, I think my video just cut out. Um, hopefully you guys can still hear me. Oh dear. Sometimes this happens with my phone. Okay. All right. Sorry about that interruption. So the uh, harmonic analyzer uses a series of uh, different sized gears and uh, levers and springs to create sine waves. And then um, using the springs, it adds up all of the sine waves and it can be used to create complex sinusoidal functions. And the very interesting thing about it is you can also use it to do the reverse. So you can use this to do harmonic analysis or Fourier transforms on a, uh, a drawn graph and this is absolutely fascinating that um, it is possible uh, because I find Fourier transforms to be very difficult uh, for me to calculate. I've step, stayed away from them um, but this machine will do this and it's so incredibly old um, but I would highly recommend watching that video by Bill Hammond. Uh, he does a great in-depth um, a video on how it works and the history of it. Um, so I'm going to go back to Babbage. Um, let's load up the Babbage engine. Where's the other picture? Here it is. All right. So uh, Babbage's machines uh, were very complex, but according to his calculations, they would be able to do very complicated math and they would achieve absolute feats of wonder. Uh, the only trouble is that these machines that he designed, and he designed two different kinds, um, well, more than two, but two uh, very famous uh, kinds. Uh, this one is the difference engine that you can see here. Um, but the the machines were never constructed until well after his death. Uh, I believe this machine wasn't constructed until um, 1989. Um, so this would have been well over 100 years after he, uh, he died. Um, but this, uh, this machine, the difference engine, could actually do uh, calculations using polynomials. Um, this would have been very useful uh, to do complicated math because it could print things. On the uh, left-hand side of this picture, you can see a small little printer. The idea behind this machine is that uh, Babbage was upset with calculation tables. So before 
if you wanted to do math accurately for certain functions like trigonometry using sine, cosine, tangents, um, or logarithmics, um, you'd usually buy a book that had a table on it of all of the different values uh, calculated out to about five or six digits. And you'd buy that book and it would have all of the answers to almost every single number that you could think of uh, for all of those functions. This was useful because manually calculating those numbers is tedious. And so you can just look it up in a table fast and easy. However, those tables were calculated by hand. So sometimes there were mistakes. And if there's a mistake in the book that you trust to be correct, you might not think to double check your answers and that can lead to trouble. So the difference engine being also a printer could calculate these uh, tables and print the book for you. So that way there would be no chance of it being wrong. The only trouble is, is that since the machine never got built, this, uh, this function or this desire uh, was never realized. But uh, the second machine that Babbage designed after this difference engine, uh, which I also want to show a really cool close up. These are the, um, the uh, carry wheels. And this is where the, uh, the numbers are stored. It's very fancy. Um, but this Babbage's second machine um, is the analytical engine. This machine has been designed, but it still has not been made. Um, there, it would be prohibitively expensive to do, um, but all of the designs are supposedly complete. Uh, this machine would have been humongous. Uh, this uh, analytical engine is already uh, easily the size of a, a, a box car and the analytical engine would have actually been even bigger because the analytical engine was made out of different parts that you would string together. Uh, so after one module completed a calculation, it passed it off to the next one um, and they could pass information between each other. Um, the revolutionary thing about the, the analytical engine is that it could store data and uh, retrieve it. This meant that it was programmable. Um, one could write algorithms for it and perform them. This had vast applications, but un unfortunately it was never put into practice. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily mean that it would not ever have programs for it. I'll get back to that. Um, but the analytical engine would also uh, have been used to create uh, mathematical tables. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that Babbage actually also invented a, a method of printing for this where he would press the printing plate numbers in, uh, into a piece of soft plaster. And then uh, once the plaster had been imprinted on, uh, one would take the plaster out and then you could make a metal cast of the impression and then use that to print more books. So you would get the, the whole printing plate for each page of the book out of the machine. Um, so one of the people who was very excited by Babbage's machines uh, was Ada Lovelace. Uh, you might have heard of her before. Uh, she's quite a famous name in mathematics and uh, computer science because um, of her relationship with Babbage. So uh, Ada Lovelace was actually the daughter of Lord Byron, um, who had many different escapades, but um, Ada was more raised by her, her mother, uh, who grew her mother had grown kind of annoyed with Lord Byron's uh, escapades 
and uh, wild lifestyle, so she wanted to raise Ada to be similarly more reserved. Um, however, uh, Ada was very fascinated with Babbage's machine and wanted to pursue the mathematics behind it uh, because she had a, a strong fascinating fascination with mathematics. So she actually worked closely with Babbage and uh, Ada learned how the machine would work and created theoretical um, algorithms to program into the machine to do various different things. So because of this, uh, many people actually credit her with being the first uh, computer programmer, which is, I think, very fascinating. So, um, before we uh, move on, uh, I also wanted to show an example of uh, some of these mechanical calculations. Um, so I'm going to actually move the camera over here. So this is a device. Uh, this is a Burroughs portable adding machine. Uh, this is from my own collection. Um, this would date to around the 30s, maybe the, uh, the 20s. I'm, it's been a while since I've looked this model up. Um, but these machines are considered portable because they're only like 30 or 40 pounds instead of the earlier machines, which range from 60 to 80 pounds. So on this device, you have these rows of buttons. And uh, to type in a number, um, uh, people in chat, why don't you type in some numbers for me to add together? Some audience participation. All right, we got a 357. Oh, first, let me clear this. So, so we have 357. So we have to push a button for each row. And 223. 17, whoops, I made a mistake. Error. 1776. So up here, you'll see, whoops, you'll see these little bars raise up every time I type in a number, like uh, 34,500 and, uh, no, that's 3,454,333. You'll see how the bars raise up. Yes. So these, these kind of um, mechanical uh, adding machines would actually be produced well into the 70s. Um, however, going forward after the, the mid to late 60s, a lot of these machines would have become electromechanical. And I'll talk about uh, the electromechanization of things uh, soon. But these, these were pretty common to see in uh, offices everywhere. But uh, unfortunately, it's really hard to see. Uh, I don't have any... Uh, Focus. There we go. I don't have any ribbon left for this this machine, unfortunately. Um, however, when I hit the total button, oh, this is the subtotal button. We can add all those numbers up together, and the higher the uh, the printing bar rises, the higher uh, the number that it ends up printing. Feed the paper just a bit. Whoop. So we added three hundred and fifty seven plus two hundred and twenty three, yada yada. Our total is three million four hundred and seventy seven thousand uh, and eighty. I think my math is wrong, but <laughs> not too far off. All right. So 
I need to take a quick break and let someone in because the museum is actually open today uh, to the people who have tickets and I need to let the docent in. I'm so sorry, I'll be back in less than a minute. Sorry about that delay. Um, fortunately, uh, Gary, yeah, the, the, the pulling motion, actually, it, it's not too difficult. Uh, these machines actually had uh, the person operating them in mind. Uh, in fact, the, the analytical engine, uh, the one that they've built, they actually have found that a single person can uh, crank the machine and have it run. Um, all on their own. But yeah, there, there's a, a lovely satisfying noise from uh, hearing all of those gears calculate, which is one of the reasons why I love having this machine. So um, going back into to time, uh, these machines didn't stay purely mechanical. Uh, with the rise of electricity, in, uh, in inventions uh, in the 1800s, people were racing to discover new applications of uh, what electricity can do. And one of those things is it can drive uh, pistons uh, and solenoids. It can drive motors. Um, so a lot of these machines were actually upgraded with electromechanical uh, parts. Um, and I'm actually going to show an early example. This is the Hollerith machine. In the late 1880s, Herman Hollerith was actually tasked by the, um, the Census Bureau to come up with a machine that will help make the census easier to do. So he created this machine uh, that would use punch cards to uh, allow the machine to tabulate and count each person that fit a certain category. Um, so this machine was used to process the uh, 1890 census, which is coincidentally the census that was lost to a fire. So you can uh, actually load up all of the census data from every other decade except for the 1891 um, because it burned. Uh, but this machine allowed them to complete the calculations involved with doing the census machine significantly faster because as the country was growing, the time it was taking to complete the census was taking longer and longer and longer. Um, it still took them years to complete the 1890 census using the, this machine, but it, it still shaved off uh, time from the previous uh, decades census, even though the country had grown bigger. It's not a huge time save, but it was a time save. So the way that this machine worked is there's actually this little uh, lever here in the front. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but the, uh, the, here we go. In the front, uh, right hand side of the desk part, there's this little lever with a, a finely detailed little bit of things. Those are the pins. And underneath 
in that little square that's bolted to the table is a vat of mercury. So the little pins would, are just draping down loosely. And as you lower the handle, um, depending on where the holes are in the punched card, the pins will fall through or be um, kept uh, above by the, the paper. So the, the pins that went through the, the card would dip into the mercury and complete a circuit. Once the circuit was complete, the, uh, a motor would turn a knob. Uh, there's these little dials in the back. Those are the counters. And so every time the circuit was completed, the, uh, the knob, the dials would increment by one, and that was how they would count all of these people. Uh, you can also see that there's a little uh, sorting box to the side as well. That would help keep track of all of the cards. Um, so Hollerith actually uh, would go on to help co-found IBM or International Business Machines um, after he merged with uh, another company. So both of the IBM tabulator and the analytical engine uh, shared a feature in common. This is the punch card system. A lot of you might be familiar with punched cards. Um, I should have an image in here somewhere. I guess I don't. Um, so, well, I'll leave it on the ENEC. Um, so, the punch card system actually dates back uh, very far back um, into the 1800s. Uh, the method of using punch cards to store information and then retrieve it was actually perfected by Joseph Marie Jacquard in 1804. Um, by using these patterns of holes, he created a loom system that would be programmable. Um, that way, you could make intricate patterns in mass-produced uh, weavings by just using a series of cards. Um, the Yet with the, the, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, uh, more and more people wanted mass-produced goods. So that way they could uh, enjoy luxuries that were otherwise too expensive for the everyday person. And so uh, as methods of producing these objects became easier and e uh, got uh, more advanced to create finer and finer goods, uh, prices of things went down and people could buy things. Um, all of this mechanical production is very key to the existence of the middle class. Um, but the Jacquard loom, uh, which actually was not the first loom to use the punch card system. Um, there are other looms to do it first, but Jacquard created a, a, a more robust system that could do uh, more complicated patterns um, because his system involved uh, stringing the cards together in a way that they could all be uh, done continuously as opposed to being fed in one at a time. Um, so with the advent of these electric power things, uh, many of these computers simply just married uh, electromechanical things and the mechanical things to accomplish what they've already been doing. Uh, this is when you find uh, stuff like uh, electromechanical typewriters and uh, electromechanical um, adding machines where you could just press the button. You didn't have to pull a crank anymore. Um, or with the typewriters, the typewriters could now type at much faster speeds um, because it wasn't focusing on the actuation force of your fingers to accomplish. You could just tap on it. So many of the first computers, like the ENAC, actually used uh, electricity to do things as simple as just move plungers and uh, enable relays. So basically, they're just using the electricity to change switches or 
change what gears are on where, uh, as opposed to actually doing calculations using the electricity. Um, so these first electromechanical computers uh, were huge. Um, and they were where the concept of room-sized computers come from. Um, these would be made out of discrete parts. So each part of the computer would have to be um, manufactured and then plopped on by hand by a person. And so because they needed to be able to be handled by people, they had to be at least big enough for a person to work with. Also, it was difficult to make things that small anyway. So computers having thousands upon thousands of parts became very large very quickly. Um, and they also had to be even larger to accommodate the people who would have to walk into the computer to fix anything if something were to go wrong. So some of the times things would be on wheels or they would have an open back uh, to facilitate the moving parts um, and the people who had to make them, uh, repair them. Uh, one of the first computers is actually the bomb, uh, and that's bomb with an E, B-O-M-B-E. -E. Uh, this is the computer that was used during World War II by the British cryptographers in Bletchley Park um, to help break the Enigma code. Um, this was a very mechanical computer, um, but... Later on, uh, in 1944, the ENAC was compute, uh, completed. Uh, this is actually a picture of the ENAC. You can see how large it is and how many wires there are everywhere. And you can see that um, there are engineers working with women at this time. And this is actually something that uh, I think a lot of people might not expect, but Women were very present in the early days of computers because of their existing history as computers. Uh, the human element of computers kind of carried over uh, into the, uh, the electric computer. And uh, a lot of uh, women who were mathematicians would typically be on the, the team who was helping to operate computers. Also, because computers still involved a lot of tedious work, this is where uh, the, there is still sexism involved. Um, women would frequently be given the tedious programming work rather than the uh, mathematical and engineering side of the, uh, the job. So a lot of women uh, would work on these things. Um, so uh, the ENAC actually had a, uh, a breakthrough, the, the vacuum tube. So uh, it had 18,000 of these things um, and vacuum tubes helped control the flow of electricity. Vacuum tubes uh, were an object that Edison, Thomas Edison had helped pioneer um, that could uh, affect the flow of electricity but this would only work when the, the vacuum tube was warm um, because of uh, the thermodynamics of the actual the part. So this is why we say, oh, it needs to warm up uh, when it comes to computing devices because the vacuum tubes need to get hot enough for the, the, op the operation of the, the device. And so you have to sit there and wait like a light bulb slowly warming up to glow, and then your computer would start to work. So uh, I, I would love to have uh, talked to someone who have, has worked in these, these room-sized transistor computers because I'd love to know how hot these rooms must have been. Um, so it wasn't actually until 1947 that the first transistor was created. This paved the ways for a computer to control the flow of electrical signal without the need for a vacuum tube. So these, whoop, yes, uh, vacuum tubes were found in all sorts of devices, uh, not uh, well, even to today. To today. Uh, a lot of people 
still find that the vacuum tube has a certain warmth and things like uh, amplifiers. So they're still used there. Um, but yes, the, the, the transistor uh, would, uh, the solid state transistor, I should say, would allow us to transition away from vacuum tube technology to solid state technology. Um, this is where we get our second generation of computers, the ones that use transistors. Um, this allowed us to use, yes, I, I am not showing the, the, the vacuum tube. I don't have any close-ups, um, unfortunately. Um, oh, I forget which computer that one is. Oh, this is another one of, uh, th this is a, uh, a second generation computer called the Colossus. Uh, this is another computer that was found in uh, Bletchley Park. Um, can't zoom in too far, unfortunately. Um, so with the, the second generation computers uh, from the 1950s could uh, use their own electricity to control the, the flow of things. And this allowed us to use transistors to make uh, logic uh, chips and it uh, allowed us to, uh, to make more complex things uh, using NOR NAND gates uh, uh, made out of transistors. And uh, just as a fun logic fact, uh, every other logic gate and or NOR um, XOR, exclusive OR, uh, all of those could actually be made using just the NAND gate. Uh, which is the not and gate. You just need different combinations. So um, the computers of the second generation still featured discrete parts, so people would have to hand wire them. Um, I love showing off these uh, pieces. This is the uh, memory module of the Cray supercomputer. Uh, imagine having to be the person who has to wire that if anything is wired wrong, it doesn't quite work. There are thousands of little tiny wires. Um, here is what I'm pretty sure is a, um, a processing module. Again, thousands of tiny little wires. Um, this is a memory module. Uh, this is called a iron core memory. You can see that there's little rings of iron that have to be threaded through little uh, wires and they, they're woven in a complex pattern so that way each memory address can be referenced. And this is for a whopping one kilobyte of memory. For context, one kilobyte is enough to store about a thousand characters of text. So you could store maybe a couple of poems on it, and that's about it. Um, it is the, the, the sheer amount of dedication to such fine, detailed work is very impressive, in, in my opinion. But uh, this kind of memory would actually be uh, not so common. Uh, this would be uh, usually you, people would use reel-to-reel uh, -reel tapes um, because magnetic tape memory had already been invented. I'm trying to change the slides. Okay, let's see. Reel-to-reel -reel tape. Come on. Oh, I guess I don't have a picture of it. Anyway, so these reel-to-reel -reel tapes, uh, similar to how you'd store music on a, a reel of tape, uh, would also store information and the computer could uh, spool the tape and find what it's looking for uh, using that. Um, oh, you know who I forgot to talk about? Uh, I forgot to talk about, um, and now I'm forgetting his name, Alan Turing. There we go. So Alan Turing was a, uh, a mathematician who worked on uh, the computers in Bletchley Park. He was one of the, the computer engineers responsible for the bomb. 
um, who helped break the German Enigma code. Um, so Alan Turing's uh, mathematical work actually uh, branched out into the theoretical and he is also known uh, prominently for the Turing test. Uh, not, not just the Turing uh, test, but also something being Turing complete. So Turing complete just means that a machine can store information and retrieve it along an infinitely long uh, uh, memory. Usually this memory is considered linear. So a reel of tape is a string of ones and zeros. And a, uh, the last part is, is that it has to be able to, to handle conditionals. So if something is true, then do this. If something is false, do this. Uh, if a machine can do those things, one could theoretically program it to do just about anything. Uh, there are some more complex aspects of the math behind that, but uh, Turing was instrumental in uh, the theoretical ideas behind uh, computers. Um, so that's one of the reasons why uh, the, the computer can store its information on a big long tape. Um, but even today, we still use those big long tapes to store information on a computer, except it's not a tape anymore, it's a ma magnetic disk. A hard drive is a piece of metal that has uh, been coated in a, a magnetic material, and the, the data on that disk is actually stored in a big, long spiral. So as the disk is spinning, it's seeking through that spiral, similar to uh, how music is stored on a record. Um, so if it needs to find something, it can jump to the right groove in the track. Um, so it's still similar. Uh, modern hard drives are still similar to uh, the, the tape reels of yesteryear. So um, around the 50s, another important invention was uh, started to, to flourish, and that is the integrated circuit. Uh, this integrated circuit would pave the way for third generation computers similar to this one. Uh, this is the, uh, the Nova system. Uh, you're, you can notice that computers are starting to get smaller. Uh, this is no longer the size of a room. It's uh, more the size of a desk. But um, on this computer, you can actually see uh, that white circular disk at the bottom is actually a hard drive. Uh, that would have probably been uh, less than a megabyte, um, but still a revolutionary way of storing data. So these integrated circuits um, would actually pave the way for reducing computers even further because now transistors could be put onto smaller and smaller uh, forms. Now. Uh, Transistor integrated circuits are um, this piece right here, the, the stereotypical computer chip. Different chips could do different things depending on how the transistors were laid out, but it was an etching process uh, rather than uh, discrete parts, which meant that now you just had to uh, design an etching system to create your uh, integrated circuit, rather than having to hand wire every little thing. With the etching, you can do the whole thing at once and all in one part. And because of this, uh, computers can now rapidly shrink. Um, integrated circuits also helped create the, uh, the microchip, being now the, the processing elements um, were, were now a single part, uh, the, the Wait, no, I think that's, that's later. But the, the different functions in the chip would uh, reduce in size. Um, these machines were still expensive. Um, and so typically businesses, if they bought one, uh, there would be only one computer in the business and people would use terminals to connect to it. 
terminals are, uh, if you, you might have already used one before, but terminals are basically just a monitor and a keyboard, and you connect that monitor and a keyboard to the mainframe. That way you can log in from a smaller device to the big device, and that everybody shared that big device. Um, these mainframes would be useful for databases. Libraries would use them. Uh, and also if uh, just businesses need to share data uh, be between departments. Uh, during this time, between the, the 40s and the 60s, specialized electronics uh, were still being used. Uh, we weren't using a general computer to do specific tasks. Uh, sometimes we'd create specific computing uh, devices to do specific tasks. Uh, one of the most famous examples of this, um, well, not one of the most, but a famous example, um, is actually the uh, synthesizer uh, used to create digital music. Well, really they're analog, but people would say that they're digital. Um, one of the, the inventors of the first commercially viable uh, analog synthesizers is Robert Moog, uh, who is actually a resident of Queens. Um, well, he was. Um, he was born in Flushing, uh, not too far from where the Queens Historical Society is. And he was the first to create the commercial synthesizer. Uh, these circuits would be controlled by a keyboard and uh, rather than punch cards. Uh, and so his synth was popular amongst musicians. This uh, key difference made the synthesizer a more approachable uh, instrument to mu musicians. However, they were still incredibly expensive. Synthesizers are still expensive today. Um, but these, uh, the, the synthesizer actually used not just uh, one discrete component to uh, create its music, but many. Uh, you actually buy modules. So each module is its own computer that does its own thing, like vibrate at a certain frequency or filter uh, frequencies out, um, add an echo, or uh, add noise or wibbly wobbliness. Um, but you could link these computers together in different ways to create different sounds. So his, uh, one of the things that you can think about uh, the synthesizer as is a signal processing computer. Um, so you process the signal in different ways to create ple pleasant sounds. Um, with the, uh, the fourth wave of computers, this is the invention of the microprocessor. This is where we start getting really small computers. Um, I, you can see a couple of them in the background of this image. I believe that's a TRS-80 in, uh, in the background on the, uh, the middle right-hand side. Um, so the, the microprocessor was a, a major innovation because it allowed us to shrink the, the most complex part of the computer, the central processing unit, even smaller. So, if you've ever seen people showing those circular disks with a rainbow pattern on them, um, that is a silicon wafer. Those are where the, um, the microprocessor has been etched onto the disk. And so uh, once it's etched, they cut the, uh, the wafer into the tiny squares that are each of their own CPUs. And so um, this allows us, to, with this etching process, to make smaller and smaller um, chips. And the process is still being done today. We're still shrinking our uh, transistors. This is where Moore's Law comes in, if you've ever heard of uh, Moore's Law. Oh, it's uh, very fascinating, Costas. Um, so Moore's Law dictates that the number of transistors in a circuit will double every two years. And uh, this actually held fairly true. Um, 
Oh, I don't have a picture of, of it. Let me uh, try and find the, uh, the graph. So with uh, the doubling of transistors every two years, it meant that computers were get going to be getting rapidly and rapidly more and more powerful. And uh, it's held relatively true up until somewhat recently when uh, things have been getting a little bit iffy uh, when it comes to um, making computers more powerful. Uh, but you can see over time, the uh, number of transistors that we've been packing into uh, our, our chips has been increasing. And uh, please notice that this is a logarithmic scale uh, on the, the right, not a linear scale. Um, and so with the uh, computers finally becoming really powerful, relatively powerful and uh, cheaper to make, um, in the 1970s, uh, we have the Altair 8800. 80, 80, 80, Sorry, this is the uh, the computer that Microsoft would actually become famous uh, for developing software for it. That's where they got the start. Um, but in 1977, the personal computer was born. I'm going to start going a lot faster because th this section of the, the history of computers gets really complicated very quickly. <laughs> because of so many innovations so quickly because of Moore's law. Um, but with uh, personal computers, uh, now uh, a family could have a, a computer in their home uh, that would be the size of a desk uh, or the size of a briefcase, really. Uh, and then you just plop a monitor and keyboard on it. Most of these uh, computers actually would have the keyboard attached to the uh, the, the computer or it would be above it. Um, but the, uh, the Apple II, the TRS-80, and the Commodore PET were the first three computers uh, to find commercial success in um, people's homes. And so now people had access to uh, computers at home uh, or individual people in the office could have computers. Uh, the computer market here would absolutely explode with new models rapidly coming out every year. Um, and by 1982, the best selling PC of all time, the Commodore 64 was released. Um, it was called the Commodore 64 because it had 64 kilobytes of RAM. What an, a massive amount of, of RAM. Uh, for context, um, that would probably fit half of an MP3 on it. So very small, but it could still do uh, quite a lot with that, um, that much memory. And uh, one of the reasons why it's the best selling PC of all time, even today, is because nowadays um, computers are divided amongst many different manufacturers. Um, but all of these computers uh, would be able to run software on them. However, it wasn't standardized. Every computer might have a different uh, CPU that would interpret instructions differently. And so it wasn't until uh, the IBM PC came out to market that um, uh, it became incredibly popular. And so people started to emulate what IBM was doing. And so we had the rise of IBM clones. And uh, our modern computers today are still IBM clones. Uh, they are um, still based off of the same architecture from the, the late 80s that uh, gave rise to the idea of intercompatibility of software. There are still some people who, uh, some manufacturers who still don't uh, use the same standard, such as Apple. Apple uses its own standard, which is why you can't run Mac software on an, um, a, uh, a Windows computer. But you can and you can't. It, it's complicated. Um, but that, that would actually involve things such as compilers. Uh, so compilers are how 
of the code written by a human is converted into a what the machine can understand because the machine only understands ones and zeros and so we use uh, a compiler to convert from the different languages like Python, C++, Java, um, Fortran, um, COBOL. All of those get converted by the compiler into machine code, and then the computer can run it. So it's all about whether there's a compiler for that specific uh, processor for it to work. Um, a, a very interesting uh, point of history is uh, one of the first compilers was written by Grace Hopper, uh, the rear admiral of the United States Navy, um, while she was working on, um, gosh, I've forgotten the name of the machine. Um, but uh, Grace Hopper created the, uh, the compiler for COBOL, or Common uh, Business Operating Language. So the idea behind COBOL is that you would have uh, a single programming language that anyone could write software in, and then you would put it through the compiler that's for your machine, and then you could run that software, rather than uh, having to figure out which computer your software would run on. And uh, Grace Hopper is actually also famous for discovering the first computer bug uh, she coined the term um, because a moth had been uh, caught in one of the, the the computer's relays, and she had to retrieve it. And she taped it down to the uh, the computer logs, and uh, said, "We we've discovered a bug in the code." So, uh, modern computers uh, have gotten a lot more interesting. Um, this is oh. So this is an example also from my collection. Um, this is from the uh, early 90s. It has a single line of text on it, but a full keyboard and you can run uh, a program called basic on it. So you can program uh, the computer to do various different things like sing. Uh, and it's all, all on a, a, a children's toy. But uh, computers have progressed even further. Now, uh, a th this is a uh, an Arduino. This is like a, a nine dollar computer. Uh, you program it, and all of the code runs on this little chip, and you can use it for anything you want. Um, it won't run things like Windows because it's uh, it's only an eight megahertz chip, but it's cheap, but we've even shrank computers even further. This is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is a full computer. This can run um, Linux. Uh, you can plug a monitor into it, HDMI part, and you could uh, use this like you would any other computer, and it's $35 and the size of a credit card. So. Even if we're not shrinking transistors down, we're still shrinking computers further and further. Um, so the future of computers uh, is about to hit a physical limitation where we cannot shrink a transistor anymore because uh, of the limits of physics. Um, after a certain point, uh, physical properties change when you get into the really tiny, tiny zone. Um, so we're, we're going to have to start innovating uh, computers in new ways, such as uh, neural networking, artificial intelligence, um, but that's a whole separate other topic. Um, so now that we're at the present, I think uh, it's about time to wrap it up. Um, if any of you guys have any questions, I would love to uh, geek out with you guys. I am a huge fan of uh, computers and um, all of their forms over time. You're very welcome.
yeah, I know I, I accidentally ran a little bit over, but I had lots to say. You're very welcome. Also, if you have any further questions, um, please feel free to email me. Um, I'll do my best to answer uh, your, your questions. Eight inch floppy disks, ooh, those are much bigger. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, my first computer was a five and a half inch floppy, um, but the real big ones, I, I know those did exist. Yes, this was recorded. Um, I don't know exactly when we'll publish this on our website, so keep an eye out for it on our website, uh, www.queenshistoricalsociety.com. Um, oh, let me pay, uh, post in chat the uh, other links that I have. Um, I have a lot of um, interesting videos that you guys should see. Uh, oh, sorry. My name is Jaron. Uh, I don't think I m introduced myself at the at the beginning. Um, so I'm going to paste a bunch of links, and uh, I highly recommend all of them. Um, I've already posted the. Um, okay. Whoops. This is the analytic, uh, the harmonic analyzer. Um, this is a video that actually shows a, uh, a central processing unit, a CPU that's been blown up to the size of a room. So that way you can uh, actually see the data moving through it. Um, and then here's a video on, uh, this is on the Jacquard loom. Um, here's an example of mechanical computing, uh, being used to play a game. Um, and here is an example of someone taking the idea of a Turing machine and going wild with it by uh, making one out of wood. And let's see. This is a video on uh, made by the 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 army during uh, the the war. Uh, that goes over how computers are used on uh, naval ships to calculate trajectories. And then I have one last video on doing uh, mathematics using marbles. All of these are, are great little rabbit holes to explore. Um, I also like all of these videos because they also have a certain element of entertainment to them. Um, so if you want to just geek out for another couple hours, I would recommend just following all of those links. So I want to thank everybody for coming to the Queen's Historical Society's digital visit program. We have some more uh, programs coming up. So please keep an eye on our website for upcoming events. We have our fundraiser coming up uh, in mid-October. Uh, we have another digital visit on the history of religious freedom in uh, Queens and early colonies. And um, there's more, but I forget all of them off the top of my head, but they're all on our website. So thank you everybody for spending the time with me today. And I hope to see you in a future visit. <laughs>